Welcome back to the reading of Don Casmurro by Machado de Assis, translated with the introduction by Helen Caldwell. Six, Uncle Cosme. Uncle Cosme had lived with my mother ever since she became a widow. He was already a widower at that time, like Cousin Justina, which was the house of the three wielded folk. Fortune many times changes the intentions of nature. Formed for the serene functions of capitalism, Uncle Cosme did not get rich in the law courts. He made a living. He had an office in Old Rua de Violas, near the courthouse, which was in the abandoned Aljubi prison. He was in criminal law. José Dias never missed Uncle Cosme's speeches to the jury. He was the one who helped him on and off with his robes and paid him many compliments as they left the courtroom. At home, he reported the arguments. Uncle Cosme, for all he tried to appear modest, could not help smiling a little. He was a fat, heavy man, short of brief and sleepy-eyed. One of my earliest recollections was watching him mount. Every morning, the mare that my mother had given him and which carried him to his office. The slave who had brought the beast from the stable held the bridle with while he lifted his foot and set it in a stirrup. There followed a minute of rest or reflection. Then he gave an impulse, the first, his body threatened to go up, but it did not. Second impulse equaled effect. Finally, after several long instants, Uncle Cosme gathered together all his forces, physical and moral, gave a final leap from the earth to this time landing on the saddle. It was seldom that he mounted, failed to show by a gesture that she had just received the wound. Uncle Cosme adjusted his flesh, and the animal went off at the trots. I have not forgotten either what he did to me one afternoon. Two born in country, I left there when I was two, and despite the customs uh, of the time, I did not know how to ride and was afraid of a horse. Uncle Cosme grabbed me one day and threw me astrid his beast. When I saw myself up high, I was nine. Alone and forsaken, I began to yell desperately, Mama, Mama. She came to rescue, pale and trembling, thinking they were killing me. She took me down, painted me, while her brother asked, Sister Gloria, a boy that size afraid of a gentle animal, he's not used to it. He'd better get used to it, even if he's padre, if he's a country vicar, he'll ri have to ride horseback, and here in the city, so he's not yet a padre, if he wants to cut a fine figure like other young fellows and doesn't know how to ride, he'll blame you for it, Sister Gloria. Then he'll have to blame me, I'm afraid. Afraid? Oh, afraid. The truth is, I did not learn until much later, when then less from taste than because I was ashamed to admit, I did not know how to ride. 
Now he's really going to take an interest in the girls. They said when I started, to l I started the lessons. The same could not be said of Uncle Cosme. In his case, it was a habit and a necessity. He no longer went in for love affairs. They say that as a young man, he was a devil with the woman, women. Besides being a hot-headed party man, but the years had taken from him most of his hardware, both political and sexual, and his fat had put an end to the rest of his ideas, public and specific. Now he merely performed the duties of his job, and without love, in his hours of leisure, he looked on or played back game on. Now and again he made a witty remark. 7. Dona Gloria My mother was a good soul. When her husband died, Pedro de Albuquerque Santiago, she was 31 years old and might have returned to Itagui. She chose, chose, she chose to remain near the church in which my father has be, ha, was buried. She sold the plantation and slaves, bought others whom she rented out or sent into the streets to earn her money. She bought a dozen or so buildings, a certain number of government securities, and kept on living in the Matacavalo's house, where she had lived the last two years of her married life. She was the daughter of a mistress of a plantation in Minas Gerais, descendant of another plantation owner from São Paulo of the Fernandes family. Well then, in the year of grace, 1867, Dona Maria da Glória Fernandes Santiago was 42 years of age. She was still pretty and girlish, but she stubbornly concealed the remnants, the remnants of her youth, however much nature sought to preserve her from the action of time. She lived encased in her eternal dark dress without adornments, a black shawl doubled in a triangle and fastened at the breast by a cameo. Her hair was brought back straight on either side and cocked up at the nape of the neck with an old tortoise shell comb. Sometimes she wore a white cap with a frill. Like this, she plodded quietly back and forth, back and forth, in her plain old cordovan shoes, watching and supervising the work of the whole house from morning to night. I have her portrait there on the wall beside that of her husband, just as they were in the other house. The colors have darkened, but still give an idea of both of them. I do not remember anything of him, except vaguely that he was tall and wore his hair long. The portrait shows round eyes that follows me everywhere, effect of the painting that terrified me while I was little. His neck rises out of a black cravat of many folds, the face is shaven except for a little patch by the ears. The portrait of my mother shows she was beautiful. She was twenty then and held a flower between her fingers. In the picture, she seems to offer the flower to her husband. What you read in the face of, a both, of both is that if conjugal felicity can be compared to the grand prize in lottery, they had won it with the ticket they purchased together. 
I conclude that lotteries should not be abolished. No one holding a winning ticket has yet charged them with being immoral, just as no one has found fault with Pandora's box because hope remained at the bottom of it. She has to stay somewhere. Here I have them, the two of them, rapidly wed in the long ago, the loving ones, the locked ones, who went from these two the other world to continue a dream most likely when i grew weary of the lottery and pandora i raised my eyes to them and i forgot the blanks i have drawn in the cursed box they are portraits that could pass for originals the one of my mother holding the flower toward her husband seems to say I am all yours, my gallant cavalier. That of my father looking out to at us makes this commentary. See how the girl loves me? If they suffered annoyance, and I know nothing of them, just as I know nothing of their sorrows. I was a child, and I commenced by not being born. After his death, I remember that she wept bitterly. But here are the portraits of both, and the full hand of time has not smuggled the first impression. They are like snapshots of felicity. Thank you for listening and keep up with the reading of Don Casmurro by Machado de Assis. See you next time. Subscribe to the channels. Bye bye. <laughs>